Herzlich willkommen am Hamburger Institut für Sozialforschung. We cordially welcome everybody at the Hamburg Institute for Social Research tonight. And we're pretty, pretty happy that most of you made it here on time. You might notice that probably over the evening, um, more and more people might come in. Um, you have, all of you have realized that it might be not so easy to get here tonight. Because, um, well, Hamburg obviously has begun to steal itself to host the Ministerial Council of the OSCE. Um, and prepare for all the turmoil it usually, um, well, entails. Um, while the 57 ministers um, of the OSCE participating states will be debating questions of European security about two kilometers away from here, pretty much this direction, um, the HIS proudly welcomes more than 30 researchers from all over Europe to the first Hamburg workshop on violence research. Many of you are here today. Welcome uh, to the participants of the workshop. Um, you have come here together to discuss theoretical questions and empirical evidence on the topic of violence and control in civil wars and violent state making. Now more than ever, since the emergence of the international community of nation states, violent groups successfully challenge this given order on the outside and the authority of state actors on the inside. They do so by applying short-term methods and long-term strategies to seize and especially consolidate physical control over state territory and social control over a state's populace. During the day, we have already discussed all in all eight diverse as much as ambitious projects on the role of territory for terrorist and rebel groups, gangs and other contenders of state authority. Tomorrow and Friday, we'll have the opportunity to connect these findings with many other projects and research frameworks and focus on the theorization of social and territory control from the perspective of different disciplines, including political science, sociology, history, and Islamic studies. The empirical cases will be covering a wide range on manifestations of collective violence in Ireland, Trinidad and Tobago, Chechnya, Somalia, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Palestine, Turkey, and last but not least, Iraq and Syria. With the case of the so-called Islamic State, Adawlat al-Islamiyah fil Iraq wa Sham, as one of our major cases of reference during the workshop, which is also the topic of my current research here at the HIS. So uh, for the challenging task to offer both a comprehensive backdrop for our academic debate and an interesting and challenging approach to current developments in Syria for an interested audience in Hamburg, which is you, as I hope, we are delighted to welcome one of the most distinguished experts on recent history and politics of Syria. Raymond Hinnebush, who has traveled here to Hamburg from the eastern shores of Scotland, has been working on Syria and its role in the region of the Middle East for several decades now. He's a professor at the School of International Relations at the University of St. Andrews. His research combines the fields of comparative politics, international relations, and developmental studies. His publications, um, I will not go into detail too much um, because probably would take as much time as his lecture itself would take to um, give you all of his publications, but they cover a wide range of topics with a focus on foreign policy, rural politics, and agrarian development, elites, authoritarian regimes, and political parties. Among his numerous publications on the region, we find several books published in English and Arabic, the most recent in 2015, a new edition of the International Politics of the Middle East, which first was published in 2003. Over these past few years, Raymond Hinnebush has presented and debated his research at the London School of Economics, King's College London, and the Middle East Institute in Washington, DC, to name but a few centers of scholarship and research on the Middle East Raymond Hinnebush is connected with. Last but not least, I want to mention that Raymond Hinnebush is director and co-founder of the Marques Sadirasat Asuria, the Center for Syrian Studies, also located at St. Andrews, where he brings together Western, but especially Syrian expertise to foster scholarship and dialogue about Syrian exchanges between Syrian and British scholars and others. Among its many contributions to scholarship on the Middle East, I consider the CSS focus on the training of Syrian scholars to be among the most relevant and noteworthy. The networks of over 75 international scholars of Syria, its online journal, Syria Studies, and its fellowship program are not designed to benefit Western scholars alone, but explicitly support Syrian academics, making the Center for Syrian Studies a place for open-minded and diverse research and scholarship. 
Bearing in mind this unique connection between Western and Middle Eastern scholarship, I am especially excited about a lecture tonight, which aims to make sense of a crisis that for sure will be a major topic of debate, a mere stone, stone's throw away from here at the OSCE meeting. A crisis which has emerged as one of the major challenges for European and international security today, the Syrian civil war, which has been going on for the past five years. So, and on first glance, it appears as it ha might have been inspired by the Arab uprisings. Um, the youth of the city of Dara'a had placed their graffiti on the walls of their school in early 2011. You all remember the slogan, the people want the fall of the regime. Ashaab yurid isqat an nidam President Bashar al-Assad has been fighting his own people and rebellious groups ever since, and with pretty much the same methods. However, the tensions and conflicts tearing apart Syria's society today date back so much further and are intrinsically connected with the sclerotic political system of Syria, Bashir's heritage from his father Hafiz. A heritage Bashir was not able or maybe didn't want to leave behind. Raymond Hinnebush has come to the HIS to shed light on these processes and dynamics that started at very low levels of violence and nonviolent protest and ended up to become one of the most atricious wars of the 20 21st century. Understanding civil war and state failure in Syria, please join me in welcoming tonight's keynote speaker, Raymond Hinnebush. Thank you very much, Miriam. I'm uh, delighted to be here at this intriguing workshop in which uh, I can see that uh, a lot of, of scholars will be delivering uh, cutting edge new research on uh, failed states, uh, including countries like Syria. My own uh, discussion tonight uh, does not purport to convey to you new research. Rather, uh, what I've tried to do is to look at what we know already about Syria's trajectory and to, to convey a long-term sort of macro view of this rather depressing story in the hope that this might provide some context for at least uh, some of the more in-depth uh, papers which will convey to us new thinking about uh, failed societies, civil wars like Syria. So um, it seems to me that uh, most of the narratives that you are likely to encounter about Syria all tend to overfocus on the present day, forgetting the historical context, or simply on the internal actors that are fighting it out in Syria. Now, it, it seems to me uh, that to correct, in a way, uh, for these biases, historical sociology provides us with a useful lens. And there's, there's two kinds of conceptual advantages, I think, which historical sociology provides uh, to better help us grasp uh, the Syrian crisis. One is the notion of path dependency, that is, that, that history matters, historical structures profoundly constrain the agents that are fighting it out today. Also, agents reproduce power practices that historically have appeared to work, like neopatrimonialism. Second uh, insight that historical sociology gives us, which I think is absolutely crucial to understanding what's going on in Syria, is the notion of the co-constitution of states and state systems. Just as historical sociology argues, states and state systems co-constitute each other, so also it seems to me that state failure is co-constituted by both internal and external actors, and one cannot understand what's happening without looking at the interaction of those two. So that, that's a sort of uh, theoretical preliminary, if you will, which uh, encapsulates perhaps the approach which I'm going to try to take. Now, uh, in keeping with the notion that history matters, it seems to me you've got to go back to the beginning of the story, the original sin if you want, the so-called Sykes-Picot. As Fromkin called it, the peace after World War I, the peace he said to end all peace. 
because arguably it imposed a flawed state system in the region, particularly in the Levant states, which in some ways were almost set up to fail. Identity fragmented, irredentism was pervasive in these societies. They were deeply vulnerable and periodically experienced civil wars, revolutions. They gave rise to radical trans-state movements, revisionists that want to remake the flawed state system. Of those movements, the Ba'ath Party was one, and it was in some ways the most successful, at least in the sense that it took power uh, in Syria and Iraq. And then, after that, you have a period which could be called Ba'athist state building, which goes on from roughly 1963 until the current period, a couple decades, in which the Ba'ath Party appears to consolidate regimes, appears to strengthen identities with the two uh, states where it takes power. And this appears for several states to be robust and durable, but as we, as we see, as we, as we learn, uh, the very power building practices, which in some respects appeared, in the sh at least in the short term, to be successful, had over time a negative side effects generated vulnerabilities, which then uh, their consequences we can see in the contemporary period where we have returned to the kind of instability that we saw in the immediate post-independence period, except that it's deeper and more violent than it was then. Part of the story of understanding Syria today has to begin, it seems to me, also with looking at how the Ba'ath under Hafez al-Assad set about constructing what appeared to be a durable state. The formula that Hafez hit on is an old formula. Uh, I think it's well described by Weber's concept of neo-patrimonialism. Uh, this appeared to be the right ingredients, the, this combination of patrimonial and bureaucratic practices. On the patrimonial side, Hafez built a core elite of lieutenants around the leader who were bound to him by asabiya, that is people from his family, his tribe, and his sect, particularly, namely the Alawis of Syria. These sectarians, trusted men, were put in control of the security apparatus. That apparatus that, that was charged with the hard repression of opposition. And their stake in the regime was so strong that in spite of being called upon to carry out these repressions, they were unlikely to defect. But in addition to these patrimonial practices, they were combined with cross-sectarian, cross-class alliances, which co-opted wider social forces, incorporated within regime bureaucratic institutions. For example, you had the co-optation to ministerial office was based on a kind of ethnic or sectarian arithmetic, so everyone seemed to be represented. You had the party organization of the Ba'ath Party, which penetrates all communities, that was paralleled by what could be called populist redistribution, in which land reform made land available to ordinary people. State employment became widely available to ordinary people. So in other words, what these practices were doing is giving wider strata stakes in the regime. At a later point, there is a economic liberalization, which is meant to and successfully does co-opt the merchant class of Damascus. Hafez al-Assad proves very good at acquiring rent, whether in, ter in terms of foreign aid or later on it will be oil revenues. Uh, rent which provides him with patronage which he can use to incorporate constituencies. And legitimacy of a sort built around the notion of secular Arab nationalism, which is the ruling ideology. Now, the test of this regime's apparent robustness was uh, its ability to survive the Muslim Brotherhood Ikhwan uprising of 1978 to 82. And in some ways, the explanation for the regime's ability to survive this quite formidable challenge uh, links right back to its, the peculiar me mechanics of its neo-patrimonial construction. It survived because, on the one hand, the Alawi-dominated security forces were loyal. They did not defect. On the other hand, and that's part of the 
patrimonial side of the regime. On the other hand, the other explanation for why the regime survived this is that the, the Sunnis who the Ikhwan hoped to mobilize as a, as a majority against the regime uh, in fact were fragmented, and they were fragmented because many were incorporated into regime institutions, Sunni peasants who had got land reform land, uh, or those such as the Damascene Sunni bourgeoisie, which had been co-opted, and they remained loyal in spite of this crisis, and so the regime survives. Um, in other words, its, its bureaucratic side as well as its patrimonial side together served its survival needs. And so, uh, Indeed, uh, Ba'athist regime building did appear robust. This wasn't the only crisis. The repeated crises that this regime survived. And one could say its sibling in Iraq also, built in a similar way, survived repeated crises. But what wasn't perhaps always obvious, although it must have been to the man at the top, is that this took a delicate balancing act. You had to balance between the two components, ingredients of the regime, the patrimonial solidarity, you had to keep it together, but you had to make sure that that didn't rule out bureaucratic inclusion of people outside the in-groups. And this delicate balancing could be upset, and of course, it does get upset. It gets upset under, under Hafez al-Assad's son, Bashar. Here is where we begin to see the deconstruction of Ba'ath Assyria, which is the road to state failure. So, uh, crucial to look at this to explain this depressing trajectory uh, which has led Syria uh, to the, the current uh, impasse. Now, what went wrong under Bashar al-Assad? This uh, project, if you will, of Bashar al-Assad's, which he took to be modernizing Ba'athism, uh, was not unique. In, in, in fact, it was only one case of many similar uh, attempts across the region where regimes which had initially been populist versions of authoritarianism built on the basis of some kind of public support, for example, from land reform peasants or on the basis of nationalism, this populist authoritarianism everywhere moving into what I call a post-populist era, driven by the global hegemony of neoliberal capitalism. The perception was that these regime, that modernization meant moving towards the market huh? and away from the old defunct socialism, uh, which had been the dominant ideology when these regimes were constructed. And what also usually was seen as going along with this movement from populism to post-populism was what's been called authoritarian upgrading, which, which uh, I take to mean uh, certain techniques or strategies adopted to compensate for the abandonment by these regimes of the initial populist support basis on which they'd consolidated their power. They're now abandoning their old constituents, so they've got to somehow compensate for this. And this is what I take to be authoritarian upgrading. The problem is, though, that for every problem this fixed, there were negative side effects that produced new vulnerabilities. Let's look at that. Authoritarian upgrading under Bashar al-Assad. What it uh, essentially involved for him, uh, succeeding his father, um, inheriting a state which had certain economic vulnerabilities, but also inheriting his father's cronies, his father's uh, close lieutenants all around him. So for him, there were two challenges that upgrading had to involve. One is concentrating power in his presidency. The other is overcoming the economic vulnerabilities. And I should have said that uh, for him, the economic vulnerability was most obvious because Syria's oil revenues were projected to run out in maybe half a decade. And so there was going to be a revenue shortfall uh, that had to be plugged. So this is the situation Bashar uh, al-Assad faces. Um, now, in terms of adapting to the uh, projected decline in rent, oil revenues, uh, his formula is to pursue this kind of post-populist economic liberalization. The idea is to access alternative sources of revenue, such as expatriate capital, golfy capital. And that will be done through adopting neoliberal policies like tax cuts for the wealthy, removing tariffs that protect state industry, cutting welfare subsidies, public services run down, et cetera. This is a, a, 
This is a, a formula that one sees across the region and, and Syria a, a bit late, nevertheless going down the same road. The other thing he's doing, concentrating power in the presidency to overcome resistance to his economic project from entrenched interests, such as the, his father's old lieutenants. And uh, there is a struggle, goes on for about half a decade, but in 2005, uh, Bashar al-Assad is able to purge the Sunni old guard, and so he's in command pretty much uh, at this point. And uh, just as these, these, these old guards, most of them Sunni, barons uh, who had shared power with Hafez, as they're pushed out, uh, new groups of crony capitalists are sort of taking their place around the president. In particular, Rami Mahlouf, his cousin, who is uh, notorious uh, as, a, as a crony capitalist. It's this, this new group of crony capitalists replacing the old guard. Now, um, initially, authoritarian upgrading seemed to work. Um, the, the, the president seemed to enjoy quite a bit of legitimacy because he was young, but also standing up against the US invasion of Iraq was very popular among Syrian nationalists. Also, uh, upgrading seemed to be working in the sense of co-opting new constituents to make up for those being excluded. New businessmen, returning expatriates appear to be joining the project. Gulf investment does come in. There's a new life of consumption in the big cities, uh, which uh, is enjoyed by the, the upper middle class. Uh, they had nothing like that under Hafez, who had a kind of austere socialism. And uh, also, uh, while the, the regime is cutting welfare, it is sort of offloading some of its welfare responsibilities to Islamist charities. And, and that, in a way, is, is pleasing Isl certain moderate Islamist opinion. And they're arguably also being brought into the regime coalition. But in fact, we know now, that there were all sorts of new vulnerabilities being created by this authoritarian upgrading. One thing was the narrowing of the elite. Pushing out the old guard, most of them Sunni, meant that their clientele networks to society were lost. It also meant that the center of power is becoming kind of over-dependent on the presidential family and the Alawi security barons and some technocrats. Uh, and, uh, the, many of these people don't uh, enjoy the support bases that those pushed out uh, used to enjoy, and so the regime is losing those. The other thing that's happening is the party apparatus is debilitated under Bashar. The party, the worker and peasant unions uh, are kind of starved of funds. They decline. They represent the regime's connection to its initial rural Sunni constituency. So as, as, the, uh, as the elites narrow, and the organized party and union linkage with the regime's old constituencies is debilitated. What, the re what is happening is the regime is becoming more minoritarian and more upper class. And the balance is shifting in this, this, this delicate balance between patrimonialism and bureaucratic practices is shifting towards the patrimonial side at the expense of the bureaucratic institutions which had a certain inclusive capability, such as the party, the trade unions, et cetera. So that's what's going wrong. And then the final thing one can see in terms of explaining why the regime proved unexpectedly vulnerable to the spread of the Arab uprising into Syria <laughs> was the way the regime had neglected its former popular base, namely the peasantry. This is where the regime came from. They came from the peasantry. But now, many decades later, neglecting that. And there will be costs. Uh, what is happening with the peasantry? A number of things are happening which are alienated it from the regime. One is inexorable population growth, decade after decade, on relatively fixed land resources, means a lot of the land reform peasants the regime had given land to, their sons are landless. There's nothing for them. Uh, they've got to go on a job market. Then the peasantry is hit by a drought of unprecedented severity, nothing like it for decades and decades. At the same time, Islamism kind of had been percolating into the countryside uh, and is uh, a countryside which 
even a couple decades before, had been rather immune to the appeals of the Muslim Brotherhood. They did not support the Muslim Brotherhood. But now this ideology is seeping in the countryside. And that, what that means is that rural people have grievances, but they now also have an anti-regime ideology, Islamism. So putting this together make, helps us to understand why the rural areas, the small towns, and the suburbs into which a lot of the victims of the drought flocked, the suburbs around the cities, became the hotbeds of discontent that would be mobilized in the uprising. OK, now let's look at the uprising. The next issue I want to deal with, the next puzzle, if you will, is why did nonviolent protest not enable democratic transition in Syria? Of course, the, the, the protesters' uh, demand was for democratic transition. And uh, there are two rather important theories which tell us what are the conditions under which such a transition could happen. And uh, it's useful, it seems to me, to look at the Syrian case and see which of the conditions were there, which weren't. Why didn't we get the transition? Well, the nonviolent resistance theory tells us there's four things you need. Mass mobilization of nonviolent protest. Then, uh, if the regime responds with repressive violence, that only stimulates further protest and resistance. We got that in Syria. That was happening, huh? But the other two ingredients is this has got to produce a fracture in the ruling elite and defection of the security forces if the transition is to be successful. That, of course, does not happen. Now, another theory, uh, which perhaps sh sheds some light on why it, it doesn't happen and what, what the conditions had to hold for this to happen, uh, is the theory of pacted transition. This theory tells us to get a democratic transition, you have to have a split in the ruling elite, but it's, a, it, it, it's one that happens in a special way. Soft liners in the elite marginalize the hard liners. Soft liners, they want to deal with the opposition. And uh, soft liners are able uh, to marginalize the hard liners if there's enough mass protest, and it remains nonviolent, uh, that this sort of empowers the softliners in the regime. But also, quite important, is the opposition has to be dominated by softliners or moderates. That is, people who refrain from the use of violence and refrain from calling, uh, let's say, for regime overthrow. Uh, but in other words, people who want reform. Huh? If these people dominate the opposition, the softliners, then uh, it, it then becomes possible for the softliners in the regime and in the opposition, theoretically, to marginalize the hardliners in the opposition. And so you can get the transition. Well, uh, unfortunately, in Syria, what we find is that the hardliners on both sides marginalize the softliners on both sides. So Bashar, of course, uh, at, at a certain point, aligns with the hardline security chiefs. Now, here's an interesting counter counterfactual. Uh, what, what if he had decided to lead the softliners instead? At the time, when the uprising first began, there were lots of people in Syria and observers who were hoping that he would opt to lead the softliners and therefore marginalize the hardliners and Syria would make a transition to some more pluralistic, uh, maybe partly demo more democratic sort of regime. But, but he did not, huh? for various reasons, which I, I, I won't go into, but if anyone wants to discuss it, we can. Uh, nevertheless, of course, uh, uh, his opting to, to lead the hardline camp wouldn't have worked, uh, except for the fact that the rest of the elite around him stayed with him. And what we find is, is that the... the, the the scenario where uh, other elites would abandon the president, uh, as we saw in Egypt or Tunisia, allowing a transition. This did not happen. Uh, and it's probably because the, the interests, the shared interest in the sectarian affiliations between the president and the majority of the top military and political elites was simply too dense. Huh? They had, they had too much at stake in the, in the regime together with the president. And in fact, it, the softliners, and there were some, they were the ones uh, that get, get marginalized. Now, another part of the story, though, in understanding why this pacted transition didn't work, 
is one has to look at the opposition too. Huh? Hardliners prevail in the regime, but they end up prevailing in the opposition too. Now, part of the reason for that is repression by the security forces of the protest tends to radicalize the protesters. At a certain point, they abandon demands for reform and they begin uh, to call for the fall of the regime. Well, indeed, as Miriam pointed out, right back at the, at the, at the time of Dara, there were some calling for the fall of the regime. Uh, but it becomes a general demand in the opposition. And what that means uh, is, is that the moderates in the opposition, and there are some, uh, they tend to be the, the older generation wise. Huh? Uh, they, this older generation of moderates, get marginalized by the revolutionary youth, huh? the young hotheads who uh, are demanding the, the, the fall of the regime. And so what that means is there is no credible soft line opposition leaders who could bargain with the regime for a transition. And uh, one could also say that uh, one of the reasons the opposition uh, abandons reformist demands uh, and uh, becomes dominated by hardliners is that they were diluted by the false analogy of the overthrow of presidents in Egypt and Tunisia, expecting that this would be replicated in Syria. I think uh, also, though, and in keeping with my argument that, that one can only understand what's happening by looking at the impact of the outside on the inside and the inside on the outside, in other words, the interrelation, one has to look at the external factor in understanding why the nonviolent transition didn't happen. The paradigm or theory of nonviolent transition assumes you've got a world which is going to be united against a regime which is using violence against protesters. But that wasn't the case. It might have been the case in Tunisia and Egypt, but by the time we get to Syria, Russia and China are defecting, and they're obstructing this unity. Nevertheless, in the absence of this unity, the West goes ahead and begins to interfere in certain ways in the Syrian crisis. And, uh, Unintentionally, they end up reinforcing the hardliners on both sides, therefore making a transition less likely, a pact of transition less likely. On the one hand, the discourse of responsibility to protect, the Libyan example, encourage the opposition to think that foreign intervention is coming. Huh? So uh, waiting for foreign intervention, they are, they, they, uh, they are uh, hardliners, one could say, uh, are encouraged because it appears you don't have to bargain with the regime, huh? The foreigners are going to come and get rid of the regime. On the other hand, looking at the regime itself, this prospect of uh, Western intervention and the, the discourse about the International Criminal Court that's going to haul Bashar al-Assad and his cronies, what does this do? This enhances regime cohesion. They realize They've got to stick together, because if, if they don't stick together, they're all going to fall. If the regime falls, they are going to be hauled before the International Criminal Court. So on both sides, the international factor basically hardens opinion against compromise, uh, shifts the balance from the softliners to the hardliners. OK, so that was one thing that went wrong huh, at the very beginning, the failure of nonviolent resistance to lead to a pacted transition. Well, once democratization failed, it was still always possible that there could be a successful revolution from below. So then the next question we have to ask, it's sort of the next ingredient uh, in the depression, depressing Syrian trajectory, is why did anti-regime mass mobilization not lead to revolution? In 2012, uh, if you were talking to people inside Syria and out, uh, there was a widespread expe expectation the regime was on the ropes. Revolution was going to happen, but they were wrong. Why? Well, um, theoretically, uh, theorists of revolution often tell us that revolution requires two things. The regime has got to split, and there has to be, at the same time, what one might call a bandwagoning of much of society against the regime. The vast majority of the population has to come and get together against the regime. If those two ingredients don't hold, uh, 
then you're not likely to get revolution. In, in Tunisia and Egypt, they did hold, though. You got, well, we could quarrel over the, whether those were revolutions, but at least presidents departed. Um, well, why did we not get the revolution scenario in the Syrian case? First of all, in cases like Syria, where the elites are so united by sectarian ties around a patrimonial leader, regimes are much less vulnerable to split than they might be in other kinds of regimes. What about societal bandwagoning? That requires certain conditions. It requires a kind of cross-class coalition, combining the middle and the lower classes, all mobilizing against the regime. We saw this in Egypt, huh? But what we saw in Syria is that this anti-regime mobilization, this potential anti-regime mobilization, was cross-cut by communal and urban rural cleavages. In other words, the middle and lower classes did not come together as a whole. They were themselves divided by communal, meaning sectarian or ethnic, uh, and urban rural uh, cleavages. Now, uh, that of course is the social structural variable, but regime agency also played some role in preventing the revolutionary uh, scenario because the regime had a strategy to survive in the power struggle and that was to accuse the opposition of being Islamist terrorists. And this discourse, in fact, succeeded in rallying the regime's constituency. Uh, particularly, of course, the Alawite-dominated security forces, which had become quite implicated in violence against the opposition and Insofar as the opposition was turning into hardline Islamists, these people, indeed the whole Alawi community, could expect retribution if the regime fell. So this enhances the solidarity uh, at the top. Now, uh, as, uh, as the regime begins to frame the conflict in sectarian terms, it's a rather dangerous strategy because, as we know, the majority sect is the Sunnis. Now, in fact, uh, the opposition also starts framing the conflict as sectarianism in order, they think, to mobilize the Sunni majority. If the whole Sunni majority mobilizes against the non-Sunnis, the opposition will outnumber the regime supporters maybe, what, three to one? However, the Sunnis were divided. They were divided by urban, rural, and class cleavages. Much of the urban, upper middle class refrained from bandwagoning against the regime. So uh, if it's the case that revolution requires broad mobilization by a united society against a divided state, what we had in Syria, by contrast, was actually a cohesive regime confronting a divided society. So no democratization, no revolution from below. Another depressing watershed huh, in Syria's trajectory. Now we're on the way to, to civil war. Um, why? Revolution is seemingly failing, but also regime, what, what the regime would call consider counterinsurgency, uh, where it would simply defeat the opposition. Uh, this also is not successful. And so civil war is sort of the default outcome. Nobody's able to prevail over the other. And there's two dynamics that drive the civil war, it seems to me. One is the, the, the continual escalation of violence, and the other is territorial contestation. Now, to look at how the escalation of violence drove Syria towards civil war, we find that um, the regime is facing mass protest. It seems as if it's losing control of the cities. Um, it attempts... Uh, to use uh, intimidation, security forces, arrests, mass arrests, et cetera, to stop this, but it doesn't work. Huh? So what, what happens is the regime failing to contain protest at one level and violence increases the level of violence, killing in, in the process many peaceful protesters. That, in turn, provokes the term to armed resistance by the opposition. Initially, the opposition says we're gonna stay nonviolent, but the, 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 the argument uh, emerges and predominates that uh, we have to defend ourselves against regime violence. So uh, the opposition takes up armed resistance. The opposition knows this won't be enough. 
to get the regime, to break the regime, they have to do a number of things, but very important is they've got to break this alliance between the regime and the urban elites, the people in the cities. And they attempt to do this through such things as uh, suicide bombings, armed infiltrations into the cities. The idea is to undermine the economy and turn the business class against the regime and, and to show that the regime can't maintain security in the cities so that, again, people will abandon it. But the regime, uh, in turn, uh, responds to this by using heavy weapons against these urb urban areas, which in its view are harboring insurgents. So you have this escalation in violence. At a certain point, this begins to precipitate significant defections from the military, which in the majority is, is of course, Sunni. It isn't a defection by whole units, which would have really been the un, uh, perhaps the ending of the regime, as happened to Gaddafi, but, but rather you have a kind of attrition of people deserting. Huh? Uh, because it's not whole units, it doesn't immediately threaten the regime's core. But there's enough defections. And these defectors enjoy safe havens in places like Turkey in particular, and they begin to get external arming. And this, this uh, dynamic leads to the construction of the Free Syrian Army, a kind of anti-regime pro-opposition army, uh, which is increasingly has some capacity to engage uh, the Syrian army. And at the same time, if you keep in mind that, that these, this, these, this, this attrition of defections is, is depleting the regime's military manpower, uh, what, what we see is uh, setting up a scenario where the regime loses the monopoly of violence that it initially had enjoyed and, and that uh, a process of territorial contestation has set in, that the two armies fighting each other over territory. Now, another thing which adds depth to this struggle, this move or descent towards uh, civil war, is that the violence drives the rise of jihadists, the jihadization of particularly the Sunni rural underclass takes place uh, amidst this, this violence. Additionally, uh, this is the period we start to see non-Syrian militants uh, coming into the country from outside, uh, inspired by jihadist ideologies, and uh, empowering the rise of the main jihadist groups like Jabhat al-Nusra and Ahrar al-Sham. And what is important about these two groups is their fighting prowess is very considerable, much better than the Free, free Syrian Army. And they put the regime very much on the defensive. So we've got a real civil war. But then we can't really understand this whole dynamic without looking at the impact of the outside on the inside. There, is, um, there was a, a dynamic of what could be called competitive external interference. And, and, and it has been argued, and I agree with it, argued by Christopher Phillips particularly in a splendid new book called The Battle for Syria. Uh, it has been argued that it was this external interference which tipped the balance, tipped the country into uh, a failed state. Uh, otherwise, quite unlikely that this would have happened. Otherwise, you'd have probably had the regime uh, gradually prevailing. But the external factor makes the difference uh, in the sense that the opposition insurgency is essentially enabled by the uh, external factor, by the arms and the financing to pay fighters, which come from Gulf donors in particularly. Safe haven in Turkey, very important. A game-changing thing is the supply of the opposition with anti-tank weapons. This really neutralizes the regime's counterinsurgency military advantage when its tanks can no longer prevail. Uh, and what this allows, of course, is the opposition to seize control of significant parts of Syrian uh, territory. But then, uh, as this appears to put the regime on the back foot, you get the increasing counter-intervention by the regime's allies, Iran, Hezbollah, later Russia, which block what for a brief period looked like it might be an opposition victory and ushers in stalemate. This um, so-called balanced intervention, huh, what, by which you have outside powers intervening on opposing sides in a relatively balanced way, uh, Scholarship shows us that, that, that this prolongs civil war, and the Syrian case certainly shows that that is so. If, if we look at the Syrian case, we find, for example, uh, 
that uh, the, inter the outside backing of the two sides um, deters any kind of compromise settlement. Uh, a number of efforts are made, uh, Kofi Annan, the Arab League, later on Brahimi, uh, a number of efforts are made to broker a compromise settlement, but the thing is each side believes it can win if only its outside patron will increase support. But, in fact, those patrons provide their clients enough support to keep fighting, but not enough to defeat the opponent. So the outside factor keeps the stalemate going, but at a much greater level of violence than would otherwise be the case. And, of course, uh, ushers in state failure. Now, getting perhaps closer to the, uh, to the topic of, of, of the workshop, uh, what are the features of, of state failure uh, in, in Syria? Uh, the, the state failure paradigm, of course, implies that either you have order and a state or you have complete anarchy. Uh, but, of course, uh, that's, that's not actually the case. Um, actually, there, there are forms of non-state governance which can perhaps kick in to substitute for the order that states provided before they failed. Now, when we look at the Syrian case, it seems to me you see two dynamics. One is governance fragmentation. Now, what I mean by this is that, uh, in a way, Syria is breaking down into little entities. And this is driven by two phenomena, the security dilemma and the war economy. By the security dilemma, I mean that when order breaks down uh, and um, it provides a scenario in which uh, a discourse arises of sectarian massacres. They're massacring us, huh? Uh, everyone begins to fear the other, huh? the identity other. And so this sense of insecurity, the security dilemma, uh, really pervades the grassroots. And what does it mean? It means for your security, you, defend, you have to depend on your own communal group, whatever it is in your own neighborhoods for security. So what we tend to get is the country gets fragmented into local armed communities. Everybody's armed in their own community. The war economy also promotes this because as the normal economy collapses, the, the links which bind the country together de are debilitated. And you find that people are seeking to survive through what we might call spoils. And you've got local warlords arising who compete to kind of tax whatever economic flows are still happening, or to take a cut on the external resources. And this kind of additionally reinforces localism. So that's what I mean by the fragmentation of governance. But there's a counter process going on. And that is what we might call competitive regime formation. And I mean by that that the Assad regime on the one hand and the opposition on the other competing to fill the governance vacuum, to, to, to overcome the fragmentation which is emerging. Huh? Now, let's look first at, at the regime. Um, and I'm going to look at it in some detail because I know the opposition is going to be covered in some detail in the workshop. The regime reconfigures itself to survive civil war, reconfigures itself into a much more coercive and exclusive version of patrimonialism, but also a more decentralized version of patrimonialism. At the top of this new regime, this new Assad regime, Assad II, or three, I suppose you might say, there is the family, huh? the Assad family, the security services, the elite army units. This inner circle huh, is much tighter, more cohesive, but narrower than the ruling coalitions before the uprising. The Alawi sect, of course, uh, becomes uh, a key base of support for this regime. Alawis are absorbed en masse into the army, into the security apparatus. They tend to live in uniformly Alawi suburbs because, <laughs> rightly or wrongly, they've been implicated in regime crimes, but also they suffered very high casualties. Uh, they feel an existential threat if the regime should collapse. And they are loyalists, uh, with some exceptions. 
uh, and, and of course there, there are plenty of complaints in the Alawi community, but they're stuck with Assad, one might say. Then another part of the regime, of course, is the regular army, but compared to the army before the uprising, it's been much downsized by manpower shortages. It's been kind of reconfigured with, a, with Hezbollah and Iranian help to fight counterinsurgency, something it didn't know how to do before. The defections have pretty much stopped, but its performance is still very variable. Uh, it's worth noting, though, that this army, um, there, there's lots of evidence, it, it still incorporates Sunnis, Sunnis of a particular type, people who enjoyed upward mobility through the military and, and still identify with the army. Now, the other thing that's happening, though, besides this core, huh, you've got the decentralization of power. Power is seeping down from the center to the locales. As the army contracts, pro-regime communities assume their own self-defense. This really leads to what has been called the militiaization of the country. That is, civilians are all armed and turned into militias. Uh, some people have talked about weaponized clientele networks. Uh, Pro-regime businessmen become kind of patrons uh, to set up uh, their own militias. And these militias in some ways are self-financing through Crime, really, protection rackets, extortion. What's happening to the center-periphery relation? It used to be pretty much a command relation. The president sent the orders down and the bureaucracy implemented it. No more. What you've got instead is the center is connected to the locale through personal links or through some kind of bargaining in which the center makes threats. Uh, you, you will do what I say or, or provides incentives to, to do what I say. Uh, when dealing with what are now armed fiefdoms, suggesting that you know this is this is a decentralized patrimonialism, like feudalism, and yet in spite of that, another thing, paradoxically, which happens is that the regime makes every effort to preserve the state bureaucracy. This is big apparatus of employees uh, that was charged with delivering the various services and controls uh, to make a state run. The government does everything it can to preserve this to the point of paying the salaries of government bureaucrats in opposition controlled areas. Why are they doing this? They want to show that th there is still a state. It's our state and we're defending it, uh, so stick with us. In fact, uh, the government controlled areas still include two thirds of the population. That part of the, popu of, of the population is less afflicted by the education and health deficits compared to the opposition areas at least. Also, uh, for a long time, and it's probably still, the, the government actually has a kind of shadow presence in opposition areas. In other words, the government still offers certain services such as passports or educational exams that people need. So they travel to government controlled cities to get these services. Increasingly you find people moving into government controlled areas because they seem to have greater security. And this will include Sunnis. So that the regime controlled areas are becoming more sectarian diversified. The opposition areas less so. However, of course, the regime uh, 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 finds that uh, its, its resource base is, is always incrementally shrinking. So what one finds is that the old idea of the state providing services to everybody is sort of disappearing. And, and now the scarce resources are being confined to proven loyalists, particularly those in state jobs. Excuse me, uh, particularly state jobs. Um, in the opposition controlled areas, you have a uh, counter-regime formation. And, the, and of course, the most robust counter-regime builders have been the, the Salafist jihadist movements, such as Jabhat al-Nusra and Ashraf al-Sham, and, uh, and of course, ISIS. And if we look at them, what we see, again, it's something like Weber envisioned. Charismatic leaders with radical Islamist ideologies, leading armed movements, which have certain bureaucratic capabilities. Uh, a lot of... Governance by these movements centered on Sharia courts. They vary uh, basically in how far their aim is a trans-state caliphate or how far they simply want to Islamize the existing Syrian state. But what they all have in common is they're highly exclusionary, much like the regime. That is to say, all those that don't hold to their fundamentalist version of Islam 
are kind of outside the pale. And then uh, squeezed, increasingly squeezed the regime between the regimes, regime building or regime maintenance or reconfiguration project and the jihadist counter regime project are uh, the remnants of the local coordinating committee activists uh, grouped with some uh, remaining elements of the Free Syrian Army, that elements that haven't been absorbed by the jihadists, uh, governing in some places through elected councils, uh, usually traditional notables would be brought in also uh, to these councils, but they're highly fragmented. And indeed, they tend to uh, be under siege by various warlords on the one hand, and also uh, regime bombing and sieges targeting them in places where they are near regime strongholds. The regime, of course, wants to give the impression that the, this, this form of governance, not regime, not jihadist, is not viable, huh? Okay, um, sh should I stop, do you think? Uh, I have a little bit more. Another hour, so uh, well, uh, we let, let, maybe five five more minutes. Yeah, uh, good. There, there's uh, a final part, I guess, of, of the story, if you will, and that is uh, that this doesn't this conflict does not remain uh, confined uh, to Syria, and indeed, uh, you see a spilling over, huh? an intertwining of the conflicts in Syria and Iraq, and this is in some ways symptomatic of the fact that. They share a lot of identities. There are a lot of trans-state identities. Uh, the line was arbitrarily drawn by the imperial powers. And of course, uh, in concrete terms, what we see is that eastern Syria and western Iraq, places where the central governments have lost control, have become breeding grounds for trans-state jihadists intertwined with tribal fighters because the tribes in Syria and Iraq uh, always resented this line which divided them from their uh, cousins on the other side. And uh, of course, the line is gone now, and they're quite happily moving back and forth. Uh, they've always seen that as that those, those lines between Syria and Iraq as artificial. Another sign that somehow the conflict has merged into a single arena is the way sectarian militias now moving back and forth huh, from Syria and Iraq uh, as if it's a single arena uh, of battle. So that's, that's what I mean by trans-state spillover. Now, um, this spillover, this kind of uh, dissolving of the old border uh, opens the door for what? F efforts at state remaking. Let's redesign. Uh, a lot of people never accepted uh, the states, uh, saw the borders as artificial. And now we find that uh, the crisis, the collapse of state control over territory, state failure in a way, uh, is enabling these armed minorities to take advantage of the situation to advance their state remaking agendas. Uh, and two are of particular importance in this respect. There's first of all the, the Kurds. Now they were famously denied a state at the very foundation of the state system. Uh, now, at least uh, those who, who fear their project at any rate, uh, say, a uh, fear at least, that that a, a Kurdistan is going to be forged uh, via the trans-state links of Kurds living in Syria, Turkey, uh, and Iraq. The other uh, project, of course, is that of IS or ISIS. Now, it seems to me ISIS is, exhibits, uh, is, is in a way the epitome of this way the outside interacts with the inside in these countries uh, to produce trouble. Um, if we look at uh, where ISIS came from, of course, it, it starts, well, even before the US invasion of Iraq, but, but it was really the dismantling of the Iraqi state, which provided the space for Al Qaeda, which had been around for a while, uh, to revive itself in Iraq, huh? so-called Al Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, and then the next part of the story is uh, that uh, ISIS emerges by a kind of joining of this Al-Qaeda in Iraq with other victims, if you will, of, of 
the U.S. project in Iraq. Ex-Baathists, ex-Iraqi Baathist officers, particularly intelligence people, they become a, a key component of the ISIS movement and tribal supporters of ISIS. Many of these tribes trained and armed by the United States in the late 2000s uh, to fight uh, Al-Qaeda, but then in their view kind of abandoned by the Iraqi central government and so they're joining Al-Qaeda in a way or Al-Qaeda in Iraq uh, rising as ISIS. And of course, um, the ISIS flourishes in this vacuum of state, of state uh, failure, um, in, indicative of, of what's propelling ISIS. The financial and the military resources it enjoys, a lot of them seized from the failing Iraqi and Syrian states. Huh? So state failure, they pick up the resources. Also though, there, a lot of what legitimacy ISIS has, has enjoyed has come from the claim to protect Sunnis, to provide some modicum of order for Sunnis in place of the two failed states in Syria and Iraq. And then on top of that, there's the ideological attraction of the idea of a caliphate, a caliphate that will abolish the hated Versailles-imposed Westphalian system. And so ISIS famously claimed, famously claimed to abolish the artificial Iraq-Syria border, uh, which sort of suggested uh, that if you put their project together with the Kurds, that the, the undoing of Sykes-Picot is, is no longer unthinkable. Okay, just by way of conclusion, to sort of come back to historical sociology, uh, the idea that to understand the trajectory of Syria, you've got to look at history, you've got to look at the interaction between the inside and the outside. So the first part of the story is the way the outside powers impose a sort of flawed state system on the region. No, no more flawed than in the Levant. Uh, so a structure, huh? A structure is imposed, this flawed state system. And that narrows options for everybody in those countries, for politicians, for all actors. In this uh, scenario, you, you have the rise of the Ba'ath Party, huh? which becomes, at least briefly, the most, well, for decades, the most successful state-building agency in Syria and Iraq. Uh, but it fails, and you have uh, a struggle huh? between various rival forces to shape what the outcome of the uprising of state failure is going to be. You have the regime in opposition struggling for power, but the external intervention on top of that absolutely decisive to produce state failure. And then I would argue you've got a new structure. Failed state is the new structure that's shaping everyone's agency. That is the security dilemma. Everybody is afflicted by the security dilemma, so they're arming themselves and then um, the competitive state rebuilding projects by which uh, the regime and the, the jihadists and perhaps some of the leftover people in the middle competing to reconstruct a new order, but stalemating and blocking each other, at least up to now, in, in that process. So thanks for your patience.